people hear me? Probably they can. Uh, okay, so just to reiterate, the, there have been a switch of, um, of auditoriums. So if you're here for the um, car thing, it's in the other one. There's la last chance to leave. Yay, no takers, awesome. So, um, hello everyone, my name is Martin Edman. Welcome to my talk uh, on JEP uh, best practices. Uh, two things before I start. There are some JEP stickers over here on the table. Uh, help uh, yourself to, uh, to one or a couple uh, when leaving after the talk. Uh, and the second, uh, uh, the second thing is actually a question. Who's over here a JEP user? Okay. So uh, I would say it's 50-50. Uh, I'm asking because this is a bit of an advanced talk, and I won't be going into details of what JEP actually is. I'm going to dive deep into uh, more advanced usages. Um, and things like that. So uh, at the top of the slide, you've got my um, Twitter handle. I've been involved in the Groovy community for, for quite a while now. Uh, started using Jeb in 2011. I became the lead in 2014 when uh, Luke Daly, who created Jeb, uh, decided to move on and work on Ratpack. Hey. Uh, and uh, I'll be talking about a framework which uh, is mainly used for browser testing, so it should not uh, surprise you that I consider myself a testing junkie. Uh, okay, so uh, let's let's start with uh, some best practices, and then in the second part of the talk, uh, what we're going to talk about will be advanced usages. So basically, different tips and tr tricks that even if you've been using Jeb for a while, might, might, you might not know about. Uh, it feels a bit wrong to talk, uh, to talk about it at a conference uh, about a language which started as uh, a dynamic uh, language for the JVM. And while talking about a framework which uh, uses extensively the dynamic features of the language. But what I, would, what, what, what I would advocate nowadays is writing your JEP code in a more uh, strongly typed way. Uh, this is by no means to make compiler happy or, or anything faster. Uh, it is because if you strongly type your JEP code, you get a way, way, way better uh, support from your ID, especially if you're using uh, IntelliJ. So you can get pretty much auto completion everywhere. Uh, you can get uh, better navigation, which means that if IntelliJ understands which methods you're calling on your uh, pages, on your modules. Uh, you can just basically drill down into them and see the definitions. Uh, same goes for content definitions. I will show you what you need to do to uh, be able to navigate to your content definitions and how to make IntelliJ understand uh, which content definition on your page you are actually uh, referencing. Uh, and if you strongly type your JEP code, you're going to get uh, some refactoring support as well. So uh, you will be able to easily re rename uh, methods uh, on your modules and on your uh, pages. OK, so what does IntelliJ understand out of the box? So uh, it knows that if you are calling any methods or properties that don't exist in your JEP spec, so the base, uh, so, so when you are writing a test and you're extending from, from a JEP spec, which is the base type for your, that you should use in your uh, JEP specifications, it knows that these methods, that what you're trying to do is uh, you are trying to call methods on a browser. Uh, so basically it, it delegates all these calls, and if that property or method does not exist on a browser, it then delegates uh, these calls uh, to the page class. Uh, so it knows, knows that JEP is doing some dynamic delegation, and IntelliJ understands that, so it will, it will uh, be able to figure out what you are trying to do. Um, IntelliJ also understands uh, content definitions, so it knows that a parameterless content definitions uh, that you define in your pages and modules uh, become uh, properties of your pages and uh, modules. And I've actually recently um, improved the support for JEP and IntelliJ, and in 2018.2 version of IntelliJ, it will also understand that when you have content definitions that take parameters, they become actually methods on your pages and modules. Uh, in the next version of uh, JEP, 
Uh, it will also understand what methods you can call, what is the delegate of the interact block, and uh, it will understand what methods you can call within the interact blocks, which uh, are used to, uh, to do drag and drop and uh, mouse movements and stuff like that in Jeff, in Jeff the uh, interact blocks. Okay. Um, so to get the, the full uh, support for the best support for authoring uh, in IntelliJ, what you need to do is you need to help it understand what is the current page in your, uh, in your tests. So um, by default, the, the, the page type that you are on at the moment is, is context dependent and it's, it's a dynamic uh, property of the browser. Uh, so IntelliJ is not able to figure out that you are on login page at the moment or you are on the uh, profile page or any other page, so it doesn't know what content definitions you are uh, going to be uh, writing your test against, and it doesn't, it's not able to provide any authoring support. Uh, so what you need to do is basically capture the current page in a local variable in your tests. Uh, to do that, you can use the return values of the via to and at methods. Uh, these methods return uh, the, an instance of the current uh, page uh, type, uh, and also one more thing that you should probably do is if uh, you are writing a, a method on a browser, uh, sorry, on a, on a page or a module which performs a page transition, so it changes what the current page is, uh, you should also return an instance of that new page from that method so that then you can capture it in your tests. Uh, so uh, how does, how does uh, this, how does this technique uh, look like. Uh, so basically what we have over here is we are navigating to the home page and what we do is we capture the, the value returned from, from the two methods in a uh, local variable. One thing to note is that we don't need to type uh, the, uh, our local variable because IntelliJ is able to, uh, to infer that this variable is, is uh, of this type, yeah? So if on the home page we have defined a login page link content, IntelliJ will now understand that this uh, property is of type navigator, which means that it will understand that you are calling a click method on a navigator instance, yeah? Then we take it further, um, we after clicking the login page link, we land at a uh, login page. So we again capture the current page in a variable, and then we call some methods on the login page to basically login, which probably fills out the user and password fields on the page, clicks on the submit uh, button, and takes us to a secure page, which again, we are capturing in a variable. Uh, so basically, when, when, when if, if we are typing this in IntelliJ, we would get out of completion at every single point uh, over here, and we would be able basically to control click on the login page link, and it will take us to the definition of the login page link on the home page. Uh, I think that like when you when if you if you used um, JEP in in a very fairly dynamic uh, way as what might be considered the idiomatic way of of using JEP, so without tracking of what the current page is, this looks quite verbose to you and quite noisy. Uh, but I still advertise that because I've used this technique on last two or three projects and I've never looked back because. It's so much easier to, uh, to understand the tests that someone else written if you're using this technique. It's so much easier to understand which page you are currently on at a given uh, point in the test. It's so much easier to navigate and refactor your code. Um, you can make this, uh, you, you can make it slightly less verbose, so you can, you can um, use a bit of chaining of, of, of your methods, uh, of your code. So basically, because this call returns an instance of home page, we can then access the content uh, element, login page link of that home page, and then click on it, and then we land on a login page, and we can then 
call the login method on an instance of login page like this. But just be careful with this because you can take it quite far and then if your chains become really long, then again, you're losing the context and the benefits of people being able to read these tests uh, easily uh, is lost because people just like, your, your teammates will not know if they haven't written the code, they will not know which, uh, which page they are on at the moment and, and things might get lost. Okay, so uh, let's move on to ad checks. So ad checks in JEP allow us allow you to verify that you are on a page that you are expecting to be at a given point uh, in your in your test or in your code. So one thing you should you should do is you should keep them very simple and and quick. So don't put any uh, any logic that relates to the page that certain things should should. Um, be in cer certain states. Uh, I've seen a lot of questions on the mailing list coming up uh, where people had their ad checks like really long and, uh, and they had complex verification over there. Uh, don't do it. Ad checks are just to check that you are at the right place. So most often than not, checking the title would be enough or maybe checking for one or two elements of the page that are specific to that given page for which you're writing the ad check. Uh, and remember that ad checks um, are uh, executed in a lot of places and sometimes implicitly. So for example, when you use the two method to navigate to a page, an, an ad check verification will be performed at that point. So if you have a lot of uh, testing logic inside of that ad check, it will be tested over and over and over again and you will be uh, just slowing down your test for, for no benefit. Uh, you should probably take that testing logic to a test, test it once, and simplify your ad check. Okay, so can anyone tell me uh, what's, what seems to be missing over here? If you look at this page definition, um, I'm gonna give you a hint to look at the names of the content definitions. Okay, so what about the fact that every single one of them is prefixed with a cookie bar? So what, what in my opinion is missing over here is an abstraction of a cookie bar module uh, because the page itself should not be, uh, should not be you know, um, uh, involved in the fact that there is a, in, in, should not know the structure of the cookie bar, that there is some text on the cookie bar and there's a close button on the cookie bar. All it would need to know, all it should really need to know is the fact that there is a cookie bar. So in the, the book of JEP, uh, modules are advertised uh, that they are good for reuse. So if you have the same, uh, the same piece of, of uh, content on multiple pages, or if you have the same piece of content repeating on a single page. So for example, if you're talking about a, a table of data and, and you could have a module for every single row of that data. But, um, but modules are, for more than, for, are useful for more than that. So I believe that every single time you are dealing with a logical component, um, you should, even if, it's, even if it exists only once in your, in your code and only on a single page, you should wrap it in a module. Uh, to have um, uh, a, a, a proper uh, isolation of concerns. Uh, as I said in the previous example, the page didn't, doesn't need to know about the structure of the, of, the, um, of the cookie bar. It just needs to know that it's there and, and then the cookie bar can, can hold information about its structure. Uh, and it's also very useful if you want to hide complex uh, interactions from tests. So, for example, if you have uh, an autocomplete um, uh, component, which, uh, w which uh, if you wanted to set a value on it, you need to first input some characters and then wait for it to provide you with some, uh, some suggestions and then select one of, the, all of these suggestions uh, to set the value of the um, of the uh, autocomplete box, all that complex interaction should not live in your test. It should be hidden in a module, and all you do is just tell the 
uh, autocomplete uh, drop down to set that value and how that actually happens is it should not be a concern of your test. It should stay inside of your module. Uh, I've got a talk on uh, test fixtures tomorrow uh, during the second slot of the day. So if you're interested in the topic, uh, please, uh, please come by. So I'm just going to go very uh, quickly over, over this slide. So from experience, I've learned that if you uh, invest uh, time to uh, build some code that helps you set up uh, data for your tests, that makes it uh, easy and expressive, that data setup, you're go going to be doing yourself a massive favor uh, because uh, it will speed up uh, the, uh, the it, will, it will allow you to write your tests quicker, easier. Uh, it will make your tests more readable because your data setup will be uh, uh, more contained, it will be uh, more compact, and it will live close to the test uh, where the, the setup uh, is happening, the, the, the test for which the setup uh, is uh, is happening, and w it will also h help you in maintenance of your test because if you set up data for every single particular test before that test runs, you will not um, struggle with uh, test bleed and um, getting your tests uh, inter intertwined or, or, or interconnected uh, wh when they shouldn't be. So when you're running your browser test in uh, CI, uh, I would suggest highly uh, to use a real browser. So there is a number of headless, headless web driver drivers available out there. Uh, unfortunately, most of them are either limited or uh, abandoned or, from what I looked at, not even properly tested. Uh, so the situation might change a bit now that uh, headless Chrome and headless Firefox drivers are, are out there and they are being worked on. They are not yet feature complete as far as I know, uh, so it might, uh, it might be a while before you can, you can use them, but maybe somewhere down, down the line uh, you, know, um, you will be able to successfully use uh, headless Chrome on, or, or headless browser. Uh, uh, headless uh, Firefox. But for now, you've got a couple of um, ways that you can run your tests in CI. So first one is using uh, XVFB, which is a virtual frame buffer. Uh, and then you can basically uh, point the browser to use the virtual frame buffer as the display. Uh, that uh, is Linux only, and so basically this technique will only allow you to run your tests in, uh, in Chrome and Firefox. Uh, another option uh, is driving a browser inside or running inside of a Docker container, so there are standalone Selenium Docker images available um, to use uh, from Docker Hub. So that's uh, another thing you could do. Uh, again, this is Linux only. So if you, if you need, for example, to run some of your tests on IE, uh, then you could use a cloud browser provider. Uh, that will be slower than using a real browser in a virtual, uh, on, on, with a vi virtual frame buffer. Uh, so opt for that first, probably. But uh, as I said, if you need to use IE, uh, then you're probably stuck with, uh, with a cloud browser provider. Uh, two of them are Browser Stack and uh, Source Labs. Uh, you probably know that JEP uh, has a functionality. Uh, there's a base class in, in JEP called uh, JEP Reporting Spec, which basically takes a screenshot of the page at the end of every test as well as taking an HTML uh, dump uh, at the end of the test. Uh, so, uh, a number of releases ago, a new, a new config option for JEP config has been introduced called Report on Test Failures Only. Um, and uh, you should probably uh, turn that on. Uh, it's not on by default just because of um, compatibility reasons, because that would be a breaking change, so maybe in JEP3 uh, I should probably make it the default. But basically what this does is it saves you from 
uh, every s uh, s snapshots, uh, sorry, screenshots being taken after every single test, and only takes the uh, takes these screenshots if a failure occurred. Uh, and uh, yeah, this will basically uh, speed your tests up, especially if you have a lot of them and you are take and your pages are really really long. It's taking these screenshots can can take some time. I've I've learned in the past, uh, and it will save you. Uh, Save you disk on on your CI because you won't be you won't be generating all these uh, really big reports uh, full of um, uh, all these big test reports full of uh, screenshots. So another question for you: Who can tell me when one would use the wait for method in JEP? Go for it. Exactly. Thank you very much. So the, the key word over, over, over there is asynchronous, right? So if you have anything asynchronous in your, in your, uh, 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 an asynchronous action as performed as part of your, action, of, of your test, you will need to wait for that um, action to uh, complete. Otherwise, uh, you might get uh, um, stale element exceptions if you basically don't wait for things that are asynchronous and you start interacting with the page. So uh, can you give me an example of an synchronous and asynchronous action in your test? Exactly, that would be an uh, asynchronous and a synchronous one. What happens, what happens when you click on, on a button which just updates some DOM elements? That would be synchronous, right? Okay, so basically, whenever you're doing any action in your in your in your JEP uh, code in your JEP tests, you should ask yourself: Is this thing asynchronous or synchronous? If it is asynchronous, you better have a wait for call afterwards. Uh, one thing to uh, to watch out for is really quick asynchronous actions. So um, uh, you perf you write some code, you perform the action. And everything seems to work, and then you take that uh, code to CI, and on CI the uh, the time for the request of your AJAX call takes longer uh, to come back, and you start start getting getting failures. Um, so you have to be really careful. If something is asynchronous, you better put um, a wait for after that uh, that thing. Uh, I would say that wait for or the fact that an action is synchronous or asynchronous is is an implementation detail when as far as your tests are concerned so don't use wait for in tests it's better to uh, to wrap your asynchronous action in a in a, in a page method or uh, a module method and also put a wait for inside of that method uh, to make sure that the fact that something is asynchronous is contained without, within that method. That is really helpful for other people uh, who would be then uh, using your page definitions or module definitions. Uh, other team members, they will not have to remember that they have to wait for something because the action preceding it uh, is asynchronous. Um, yes. So, Again, to re reiterate, follow asynchronous actions with wait for calls and put uh, the wait for call as close to where the asynchronous action happens as possible, ideally within a single uh, page or module method. Uh, what I've observed in the past is people are getting stale element exceptions in their tests and they are urged to basically bump the timeouts uh, for their wait for calls. And I've learned that over whatever, whatever seven years of using, using JEP to write uh, browser tests, it was just a handful of situations where I actually had to, uh, to bump the timeout of, of a wait for, uh, for, for the problem to go away. So, when you're getting it, stale element exceptions, try to stop, try to understand why you're getting it. Is it, uh, is it because you're waiting for something that uh, is incorrect and uh, waiting for that content doesn't actually guarantee that your asynchronous action has finished? 
uh, or, or is it anything else? But uh, just don't assume that, you know, let's bump the timeout and, uh, and, and try it out because most often than not, it will not be the solution. Uh, coming back to, uh, to running your tests on CI, quite often the test, the timings on your local machine will be different than timings on, um, uh, on CI. So try to, avoid, uh, try to avoid using fixed timeout values in your wait for calls. Uh, instead, use what are called presets, so you can you can give give names to uh, to the values of of await timeouts. Uh, you can configure them based on an environment uh, inside of your JEP config. So basically, locally your timeouts can be shorter, uh, whereas when you go to CI, you can use a different environment to run your test, and you can increase uh, these timeouts. Uh, it's a uh, pretty neat. Uh, it's a pretty neat uh, feature and it allows you to control all of your timeouts lengths in, in a single place instead of them being scattered all over your uh, test code base. So, browser tests are costly and I really mean it. They give you a lot of confidence, they're really a cool tool but don't abuse it. Don't write too many browser tests because they are hard to maintain, they are quite often really slow, and they are flaky. So just before writing yet another browser test, think if what you're testing with it, what you're verifying is actually worth carrying the baggage of then running that test over and over and over again over the length of over the, the life uh, time of the, uh, of the test. Yeah. So browsers are really cool, really powerful, but if you overdo it and you don't test at the right level, you're going to shoot yourself in the, f in the foot. And cross-browser tests are even costlier. Yeah? So don't, I would advise never ever to run your browser test on more than one uh, browser. Usually, it's probably best to uh, to use the browser that is most that is most popular amongst your users. Run your uh, browser tests in that, and then if you um, if you find out that there are some problems uh, in certain browsers for certain parts of your application, uh, then maybe uh, selectively enable one or two or three tests around that area uh, for that for that other browser. So, JEP tests, uh, when, when, when in, in JEP test suite, in, in internal JEP test suite, uh, there is a, um, a bunch of tests that are run cross browser, but again, it is not the whole suite. Uh, I've selected, uh, I think, around 15% of the tests that are most reliant on the browser or web driver implementation for running them cross browser and every, every, every other test that uh, I deemed not reliant on that, uh, I just don't run uh, cross-browser. And even, even with just running 15% of the test cross-browser, uh, I think r the, the, the cross-browser test uh, phase of the build is 20 minutes at the moment. So it's really, really, really long on CI. Uh, JEP has some sugar around uh, selecting elements uh, using uh, attributes. So uh, in CSS, you can, you can do native uh, attribute selectors. Uh, and in JEP, you can, uh, you can use maps uh, instead. So you can pass maps to your dollar methods with, uh, with the expected with, va with the expected values for the expected uh, attributes. Uh, these maps are then uh, translated uh, into, uh, into the native CSS selectors, so it's, it's basically equivalent. The first line is equivalent to the second line. The third line is equivalent to the, to the fourth line. I would argue that the first line reads better than the second line, especially if that wouldn't be a fixed value, but that would be some 
a g-string or you would need to calculate that value in nine or something like that that would be way more readable than than trying to to write um, a g-string a massive g-string with with a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, attribute selectors in it uh, jeb comes with an extension uh, of being able to select by text this is not something that is uh, possible in CSS uh, natively, so basically the way it's implemented, uh, JEP first selects all the elements that match your selector, and if you have a text attribute uh, passed in uh, in your selector, in your uh, dollar method, uh, it then f retrieves text for every single element that matched and verify verifies if it is uh, equal to the to the text that you are looking for. Um, so basically, uh, this means that for every single element that is matched in the first phase, you're going to get a, a web, driver, web driver command to obtain the text sent from the JVM over HTTP to the browser and back. This is, this is basically slow. So when you are uh, selecting by text, ensure that the initial select selector, so uh, do as much as possible in CSS to narrow down the amount of elements that are matched and then um, and then basically use the uh, text text selection it will save yourself a lot of time uh, spend some time to make your tests executable from your IDE ideally without any manual steps beforehand so what you want to do is basically be able to right click on your JEP test do run in IntelliJ and everything should be set up and should be running. Uh, this is really useful when you want to debug something, put in a breakpoint, go into the browser to see what the DOM actually looks like in, as part of your tests. Uh, and uh, yeah, for debugging purposes and being able to set up a, um, a breakpoint, uh, this is essential. Okay, uh, second part uh, of the talk, uh, some tips and tricks that you might not know about. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but module is a navigator. So the module base class for defining modules in, in JEP uh, implements a navigator class, which means that you can call any navigator mo method on the module, as well as you are able to use the uh, navigator methods inside of module classes. Uh, if you do so, if you use these methods, uh, these methods will be delegated to whatever is the base uh, navigator uh, of the module. So uh, over here, uh, we have a form element with a method and action attributes defined on it. We declare a module that uh, has its base set to that form element. And we have a login page uh, which uh, declares uh, a f form content element, which is an instance of that module. Uh, so then basically what we can do is we can go to the login page and on the form, which is an instance of the module, we can, for example, get the method attribute uh, of that uh, element. Yeah? We can also check if the module and by saying that the, ele the form element is displayed. Yeah, you can call any, any navigator uh, methods uh, or obtain any navigator properties on modules. Yeah. And because, the, uh, because modules uh, are in essence navigators, uh, you can also uh, override and uh, overload uh, value methods, which are used uh, to set values of elements. So for example, for uh, text inputs, uh, you would use these methods to set uh, the text value of the element. Uh, so what we've done here is we've got a date picker module. Uh, we then redefine the value uh, method to, to return an instance of a local date and to take an instance of a local date. Uh, so we are basically able to then use uh, structured types 
to, uh, to, us to, 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 vert, to, to set and read values of uh, our modules. I think this is really useful. It just it, it, it gives you a, a better code than you know dealing with, uh, for example, dates encoded in um, in strings or dealing with like three parameters that need to be passed and then you know what you do with that. So uh, I think the fact that you can override value inside of your modules and then use structure type to set and read value of them is, is pretty neat. Uh, okay, you can uh, in, in JEP there uh, there is uh, what is called advanced uh, page navigation. So basically, uh, you can after passing the, the type to the two methods of browser, you can also pass additional uh, arguments, which then are translated um, to uh, to the path of the page. You uh, you can influence. Uh, what what it is by overriding uh, uh, the convert to path methods of your page. So uh, another example, uh, what we can do is if we have a blog post uh, object that represents a blog post that has an ID and a title, we can then navigate to a post page that represents that given post. Uh, and what's going to happen over here is the URL that's going to that the browser will navigate to will be posts slash one slash my first my dash first dash post yeah because of that so again instead of building your URLs in your code in your in your tests uh, you can basically hide the the logic behind how objects represented by pages are being converted into uh, into URLs. Uh, back in the day, it was only uh, possible to pass page types to via to and at methods. Um, but uh, nowadays, you can also pass page instances. Uh, this is useful uh, when you uh, want your the implementation of your page to differ uh, based on the uh, object that is represented by the page. Um, so to build on the uh, URL uh, or the path uh, example, uh, we still have the post uh, object um, over here, but now instead of passing it as a second argument to the uh, to method, we make it a property of our post page. Uh, and then based on that property, we can calculate the effective URL of our page. Uh, but what, how this is more powerful than the example with, uh, uh, with convert to path is that this allows you to differ the implementation of your page uh, in many aspects and not just, just the URL. When I started using uh, Jeb and I've realized that navigators are uh, iterable, that they implement iterable of navigator, I found it really, really, really cool uh, because um, if you think about it, they are in essence uh, uh, backed by a collection of uh, WebDriver web elements. Uh, but what the fact that they implement iterable means is every sugar method or every extension method that is added by, by Groovy to the iterable uh, interface is also then available for you to be called on navigators. Yeah. So um, what we have over here is a bit of HTML with two paragraphs. Uh, we select the paragraphs. We have two paragraphs um, matched, this, which match this expression, and then we try to call text on that, which at the moment, which, which throws an exception because text returns a single string and we have matched two, uh, two elements. So what we can do is we can use the subscript operator to access the first, and a navigator for the first element matched by the selector, and then get its text. Yeah? And uh, navigator does not implement the get at method. 
that is backing the um, um, that is backing uh, the subscript operator. Uh, it just comes for free because Navigator implements Iterable. Yeah, you can also call use the spread operator or Navigator instances if you, for example, want to obtain a list of all of the um, uh, text of paragraphs that have matched by that navigator, uh, and then other methods that are added on the uh, iterable interface by Groovy, like with index or first. Again, these are not defined in the navigator interface, but they are added as extension methods because navigators are iterable. Uh, there is an on load method. Uh, I found it quite early when, when, started when I started using Jeb, but I never had an application for it. And I was wondering why, why is it even there. And then one day I was testing a page uh, which had a cookie bar on it, and I was trying to click something on that page. And it turned out that the cookie bar overlays the thing that I was trying to click. And basically I was, I was getting errors. And I didn't know what to do. And then I remembered about the on load uh, method. Uh, and basically, I used it to close the cookie bar as soon as I land on the, on the cookie bar page. Yeah, so basically, what onload does, it allows you to define an action uh, when, uh, when a given page is, uh, is navigated to uh, something. You, you can react to that and, and, and prepare, uh, prepare your page for, uh, for further, further um, um, interaction with it. Uh, if you ever needed to inject any JavaScript uh, into your page under test, uh, remember that uh, Jeb allows you to execute JavaScript inside of the browser that you're driving. Uh, so a pretty neat trick is to basically create a script element inside of your uh, JavaScript um, code, or yeah, inside of your JavaScript uh, uh, script. Uh, set its attribute and then append that script element to uh, somewhere to your document, uh, which means basically that uh, the URL will be resolved. The uh, JavaScript return from that URL will be loaded into your page and executed. Uh, this is pretty complex, uh, so I'm just going to guide you through that really quickly. So a bit of code that allows you to wait for a CSS transition on the navigator to finish after that transition is triggered as part of, the of, of some closure. But what is really important and what I want to show you over here is when you are uh, executing some JavaScript inside of the browser, uh, you can quite uh, easily access the uh, web, uh, web elements that are backing uh, your navigator. So if you have a navigator, you can access the web element of that navigator and pass it as the argument to your JavaScript, um, to your JavaScript uh, script, which is executed in the browser. And then using JavaScript's arguments uh, array, you can access uh, the web elements uh, that are defined in your Java code. Uh, so you don't have to select them again or anything like that. Uh, and the, uh, the, the what is returned from the arguments of zero over here is basically a, a JavaScript DOM element over here, so you can then wrap it in jQuery and do other things with that. Uh, I think that um, we as developers, especially junior developers, tend to overuse or abuse inheritance for code sharing purposes, uh, but uh, in Groovy, we've got at least two better alternatives for that. So we can use the delegate uh, annotation on fields in our classes, which basically will, um, uh, will create uh, methods that delegate to the annotated property. Uh, or we can also use uh, traits for that purpose. So to build on the previous example, uh, we've taken uh, the method uh, uh, and moved it into, into a support object. Um, so uh, 
as you can see, it will be easier for us to call it because all that we need now is just a trigger. We don't need all of the dependencies which will be provided elsewhere. And then we can take our uh, support object, make it a property of a module, and annotate that property with a delegate annotation from Groovy. And what happens is basically now we will be able to call wait for CSS transition and pass it, pass it a trigger on instances of transitioning module. So we can this way uh, kind of extend our classes without having to have a common uh, ancestor in the type hierarchy. Uh, and the same, uh, the same, but using a trait. So again, uh, it's, it's even more powerful than using delegation in this case because uh, what traits allow you to do is they allow you to uh, specify which interfaces have to be implemented by objects that the trait is applied to. So it can only be applied to navigators and waiting support objects. Uh, and it also allows you to declare what methods and trait needs to implement for it to be, uh, sorry, what methods the object that the trait is applied to needs to implement for, for the trait to be applicable to that object. Uh, so uh, then we can basically take that trait and add it uh, in an implement clause uh, at the end of our uh, class. And then again, after this, we will be able to call the wait for CSS transition uh, method on the, uh, on the module instances. Um, so for a very, very long time, I thought that the only way or the major way of setting uh, the base URL in, uh, in your JEP tests uh, is via the JEP config mechanism. Uh, but that's, that couldn't be further from true. Uh, uh, so you can also uh, do it uh, at uh, runtime. You can, you can set it, you can basically set the base URL property of the browser instance. And this is really, really handy when you are uh, writing tests uh, uh, for applications written with frameworks which start uh, the application under test on a random port like for example in this case uh, Ratpack. Uh, finally uh, if you are writing uh, if you're writing tests for um, for responsive applications, uh, you could uh, add uh, a Spock extension uh, to your test suite, uh, which uh, allows you to uh, resize the browser for that particular test uh, to a size of uh, the mobile device that you want to test on. So basically, what we have over here is we have uh, an annotation-driven extension. It's a Spock type. Uh, that annotation is driven using tests mobile view annotation. So if we put that annotation onto uh, onto a test, then for that test the uh, the, the size of the browser will be, will be changed. So what happens before the test? We are storing the original size of the window. Then before the test starts, uh, we resize the browser to 320 by 568, which is an iPhone 5 size. Uh, of a uh, uh, which is size of a screen of iPhone 5, I believe. Uh, then we execute the test, and then afterwards we uh, restore the size of the window to what it was before that test. I would uh, like to uh, take the opportunity to uh, to thank uh, all of the 55 uh, JEP contributors uh, to date. Uh, this list is basically copied from the book of Jeb, from the manual. Uh, if you're feeling like uh, getting your name up there, uh, it's fairly simple. I believe that Jeb uh, code base uh, is not that complex, uh, relatively small. And if you, even if you've never contributed to an open source project, uh, it is a good candidate to, uh, to start uh, your um, uh, to, to, to start uh, be being an open source uh, contributor. 
I will be uh, taking part in the Hacker, uh, hacker Garden today uh, after the conference. So uh, if you want to work on something job related, then please um, come over and have a chat with me. Do we have any questions? Go for it. Yes. Uh, I have never used it on a commercial project, project uh, but SoulSlap is used as part of uh, the uh, JEB CI pipeline uh, to test, uh, to do cross-browser testing. But commercially, I've never, never used it. As I said, cross-browser tests are extremely expensive, and if I can get away with just running my tests in Chrome or, or Firefox, on CI in uh, using a, a vir virtual frame buffer, that would be my um, uh, my choice because that's, in my opinion, the fastest solution and the least flaky solution. Any other questions? Okay, um, thank you very much. And enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks.